Welcome back to Introduction to Agroecology. We're going to do Unit 14, which is um, the agrological, agroecological, agroecological indicators of sustainability within the communities in which we live. Um, here's a, a picture of, if we look at some of the stuff, this is actually City Hall on the side that you see, uh, looks like all the plants. Looks like they have more air conditioning on their side than the county side is the one that has nothing. Um, what's interesting about this green roof here, and it's one of the things that you can um, make the ecology better. Um, this is, uh, I think the City Hall County building is like six, eight stories high. I'm not sure exactly how high. The difference in temperature on this side of the building is like 25 degrees difference in the summer than on the side that has the black, which absorbs the heat. Um, but what is a sustainable agroecosystem? <clears throat> um, it has very few artificial inputs, and basically what that means is you don't use as much mechanization, you don't use synthetic fertilizers and pesticides. Um, how can we sustain, or can we sustain with its own resources? In other words, can it grow whatever plants you are trying to grow in that area, on that acreage, and it doesn't degrade the soil like kind of happening today. Um, you manage pests and diseases without any synthetic means. In other words, you're using biological or natural means in which to do it, so you aren't using things like Roundup. Um, it's a system that it can adapt to itself to its disturbances, so if there's pests or diseases that come in, you can control it in natural ways by either allowing a little bit to be there and changing some of what you're doing without using the pesticides or herbicides in order to try to control them and wipe them out. Um, also, sustainable means that you're able to exist with whatever it is you decide to use <clears throat> or change to for a long period of time. In other words, it isn't year to year, it's many, many, many years that you would try to, to do that. Um, if you look at an agro system versus a natural ecosystem, in terms of some of the stuff that you have to look at, there's differences in the two. Um, a traditional ecosystem that you have for agriculture, it's a productive one. We produce a lot of food off of it. Um, in a natural ecosystem, it's not going to be as productive. So that's one of the challenges that we have is how can we feed the world if we're going to make it, try to get closer to a natural ecosystem um, and change from what we've traditionally been using. Um, in a traditional agroecosystem, the diversity is not as much as it is in a natural ecosystem because the more diverse an ecosystem is, we learned that in some of the prior units, that there are more natural um, items that occur and the different interchanges and interactions between plants and animals work to help the environment be better uh, for everybody. Um, a traditional agroecosystem, it's not self-sustaining, and by that, we have to put a, a good example of that is for corn, it wouldn't produce at the yields it is if we didn't add nitrogen. Um, one of the problems with that is, as we learned in the prior units, is that doing that, the nitrogen either is too much and some of it runs off into the lakes, rivers, and streams, um, some of it also is not used in the soil and just goes away up into the atmosphere because not the correct amounts are put on it because we're putting such huge amounts of nitrogen on it to get that corn to produce at the level that we want. Uh, it doesn't do anything to change that soil biota, if we remember from a few units back, in that all it does is help that current crop and there's no nitrogen there for it to use the next time. In a natural ecosystem, on the other hand, because of the different factors and what we use for the plants and that, the types of plants, the way in which we do it, not using synthetic fertilizers, that it's more self-sustaining and it keeps itself basically as time goes on. Um, in general terms, the closer we can get our agroecosystem to a natural ecosystem, then the greater chance it's gonna be sustainable. Right now we use monocropping, one or two crops that we're using, using all these synthetic inputs, uh, and based on that, we're not very sustainable at all. And that's what we've been trying to talk about in the whole course of how do we become more sustainable. Um, here is an example of 
uh, education uh, technician that's trying to do some soil sampling um, to find out whether or not the field, and this is as you can see, you can see the crop residue up here by where the farmer is. Um, that would indicate that it's uh, at the end of the harvest. So what they're trying to do is trying to use sustainable methods in terms of putting nitrogen back into the soil. Here's just an example of they're taking some soil and they're going to test it to see whether or not um, the carbon nitrogen and some other nutrients are staying there or, or if they're not and they're taking samples from different areas of the field. Um, some of the characteristics of a traditional agro system um, that would make them sustainable is you don't have to have a reliance on external inputs or at least you would reduce the amount of uh, reliance on external inputs to a more natural way. Um, using locally available renewable resources, in other words, um, putting in, uh, let's say, crops, leaving the soil undisturbed, uh, and, and using maybe animals to do some of the harvest. Certainly wouldn't work in the big, big, big farms, but it might work in some of the smaller ones. That nutrients would be recycled, so if you put cover crops in, it would put that nitrogen and some of the other nutrients back into the soil by leaving the um, residue from the, once you harvest the crops, if you leave that on top and then you can till it in a little bit or have it uh, deteriorate naturally, you're gonna put some nutrients back into the soil. Um, you also learn to grow in your local conditions. A really good example of that would be that um, if you, a lot of areas out west where they don't have enough water, they're trying to grow vegetables which need a lot of water, there's an example of if you quit putting crops in that need a lot of water in an area that doesn't have it, that's how you can become more sustainable. And that you don't do stuff to hurt the environment. Um, one of the things that we're putting synthetic fertilizers on, we found out that it's running off, it's there, it's not being used, it goes up in the atmosphere, so we're spending a lot of money uh, doing that. Um, we found out from way long time ago, you plow a field and a lot of, uh, Problems with wind erosion and that. Um, so we find out that if you don't uh, disturb the soil as much, you're going to have less issues with runoff and stuff like that. Um, <clears throat> here's an example of a soil conservationist um, that is working with a woman that's trying to become more environmentally friendly. And you can tell right away by looking that she has a hoop house, which is a good thing. She's extended her growing season, so she's using stuff uh, for a little bit longer. She has an animal that's in a pasture, so that's a really sustainable way. And this is just the soil conservationist that's trying to help her get uh, <clears throat> better and better with what she's doing. Pretty good guess that um, the farm here is probably a small organic farm um, that and in fact, I know it is down south, in the southeast of the United States. <clears throat> um, some more characteristics that make it sustainable. Um, trying to get that maximum yield without sacrificing the entire ecosystem. In other words, we're not gaining anything by not naturally putting nutrients back into the soil. So trying not to use those synthetic fertilizers, for example. Um, trying to grow what you need to meet the local need first. Uh, in other words, instead of just getting it and shipping it all off to market where it's used uh, now, you create food that you can use in your local area. Um, you conserve biological and cultural diversity, and the biological would be that you're getting the biota of the soil better. Um, you're the interactions with the insects um, that will would be coming back into an ecosystem. Uh, would be examples of the biological diversity. And then cultural would be the diversity of uh, the humans being used to not running out to McDonald's all the time, maybe fixing some of their own food, using food from their area, or instead of going to supermarkets, maybe going to co-ops or to um, you know the farm markets to get more of their uh, food that they're using. Um, and that kind of leads right into the created locally by local inhabitants. In other words, we're all helping each other out and making a better uh, environment for us to live in and also eating better food. Um, the pesticides, 
can mask some of the degradation you had in, in measuring your sustainability. And you can keep, as an example, what we've been doing in the monotype uh, farming, the monoculture, is that we certainly have productive yields most of the time. What we're finding, though, is that we're, we're getting more and more problems as time goes on. And we're finding out that what also happens is that we are uh, more susceptible to issues when we have them because we become so much of the crop does one thing and one thing well, it doesn't account for all the other issues that can happen in a normal ecosystem. So what we're doing here is being productive and increasing those yields, but what it's doing is we want to try to make it so that it doesn't destroy the foundations from which we have in the ecosystem. Um, some of those examples of things that we might have, if you have erosion of topsoil, you have a depth of topsoil. If that's going down, you might be uh, tilling or plowing and or you have some other reason where the soil is eroding and you have less and less all the time. You should be adding to that soil by leaving some of the chatter that's left from the crops and by adding compost and having animals out in there. Um, adding the nutrients to the soil that should increase as time goes on. Um, salts could possibly be accumulating. This would be very common in an area where uh, out west, for, for instance, where they would be using uh, irrigation and the salt doesn't leach out of the soil. Eventually, it's going to be the, up to a point where nothing will grow there. <clears throat> what we're finding is uh, in a lot of cases, the soil biota, the biota, the organisms that are in the soil are decreasing, uh, and we're trying to get farmers to understand that they need to reverse that and to make that so that it, more organisms want to be there, and if they want to be there, then their crops are going to grow better. And then the fertilizers and pesticides in that monocropping that we do, they certainly mask that degradation because you're always throwing in what you need in terms of fertilizers to get the crops to grow and then pesticides if there's any insects or diseases that are there they don't realize until they hit that one bad event that happens and then maybe they don't get enough water and then the whole crop failed because of it because it can't adjust to it like it used to in years past um, the social fabric um, could be degraded unless that community is healthy. In other words, that they're, they're understanding what's happening. They're understanding that they, we need to change what we're doing. And even in, in, in the uh, cities and urban areas that people have to be concerned with all the synthetic um, things we throw on our um, crops and that, how that's not right. And we need to help work to get people working on farms again and people wanting to work on farms again and being able to produce the food that we need if we're doing it all locally. Uh, here's an example of um, uh, an experiment where they're working on um, wheat and it has elevated levels of atmospheric carbon dioxide and it, it's a study that's called the free carbon dioxide enrichment so they're trying to see if they can put carbon dioxide with wheat what is its effect doing on plant? And it's just one of those examples of you have a lot of volunteers here that are out there trying to assist to see if they can help with uh, what's growing uh, in an area and trying different things and experimenting. Um, and it's more and more of what we need to do and um, see if it helps uh, the wheat grow better. Um, some more examples of unsustainable uh, agroecosystems. Um, you could have an individual farm that's not sustainable. And we need to motivate that farmer to become more sustainable because if you have in an area 50 farmers and only 10 of them are doing things to make stuff more sustainable, it's going to be very difficult to change the ecosystem of the area because those others aren't. So you got to provide them with the reason and get them to have that buy-in in terms of doing it in order to help make the ecosystems that we have um, better and more sustainable. Um, and you can do that by providing evidence of what their practices are as, and, and part of this is through the county agents that go out and talk to them. Other farmers can talk to, to their neighbors and things like that and show them through real life examples, hey, I've done this and look where I'm at. Um, and then um, 
try to help out um, that in terms of the length of time the system's going to be productive. In other words, you always have to be looking to make sure that what you're doing is going to be working for the betterment of the ecosystem that you're in in, a, in a, a good way for a long period of time. So you have to make sure you pay attention to that time. Um, you need to recommend ways to avert production increases. Um, instead of going in and redesigning the production system that you have, okay, maybe you can go in and recommend little changes you can make and then maybe the type of, uh, of seed they're using that would be more sustainable and better for what they're doing. Putting in cover crops would be helping it out. But it might also be the, 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 what they're doing is so bad, their production system, that it just totally needs to be wiped out. And how can you get to doing that and do it so they can still make money? Um, to get farmers to understand that developing that social relationship as being something that you're supporting one another, the people that aren't on the farm, other farmers next to you, that kind of stuff, and to make it so it's kind of fun too. If it's not fun, no one's going to want to do it. Um, also, it should be have a means to restore or repair that degraded agroecosystem. And there you're going to have to make sure they understand that what they have isn't a great system and why it's necessary to make those changes. Um, but how do you go about some of that stuff? Well, some of the ways you can do that is you, you, know, you need to go and look at what is the current health of the soil. A lot of people won't know what that is. You do that through testing. Um, estimating the productivity possibilities and that if you change the type of seed you put in, the type of corn, the variety of corn, that type of thing, you might have to convince them that what they're going to will still produce what it needs to. So you have to look at that and make sure that's working for them. Um, you need to have information on the current state of the ecology of what they're in. So you could do tests and you could see the different stuff on how many uh, the soil biota, what it is, you could also go in and, and see um, what are the insect populations in there, um, showing an example of where it's different at a farmer who's already done it and how it's being productive for him and working for him. Um, <clears throat> um, determination of a quantifiable, the quantifiable parameters, in other words, what is it that you can say, okay, Farmer Joe, if you do this, this is going to give you this much of an increase. We did this at Farmer Tom's, and this is how we got it to work. And in, in the case of what's the minimum absolute you'd need, so that's that experimentation like that carbon monoxide thing we saw a picture a few slides back. That's showing the different examples of doing experiments to find out, because unless you try different things, we're really going to never know. Um, another thing that could help it go too is compare more than one farm because it's easy to say Farmer Tom's farm is doing this, but that's one farm and there certainly are differences between farms even in the same area. But if you can go to four or five farmers and say, okay, we did it to Farmer Tom, Farmer Joe, Farmer Sam, and so on, and this is the results we get, you're not going to get exactly the same type of output and successes, but at least you're going to be able to show what those changes are and to help it out. Here's an example of just to show uh, an area in South Australia that if you go out and look at this, it's an area that has done some sustainable things and has had some uh, pretty good success at some of the stuff they've changed. But if you're looking at this, you can see a lot of the differences. You see the mixture of the forested areas and grasslands, which is probably where they could have some animals grazing. You see a lot of that in different areas. Um, and then you see the croplands where you can see the strip cropping of what it is. You can see crops going in at different times, so they must have differing crops that they have. Um, so that's just an example of an area that they've uh, had pretty good success over in uh, South Australia. Well, unless it's all burned up now, they're having all those fires over there now. You might have a problem with that. Um, one of the things we talked about was determining the health of your soil. Um, and some of the different indicators of how do you know that and then when can you do it and when can you find out of these indicators, what's the best time to take a look at it, and what is it that makes it healthy. Um, you can look at the root condition um, and you do it in spring after 
growth is established. In other words, you plant the crops and then you take a few crops out and look and see what the condition of the roots are. It might not be getting enough nutrients. A good healthy root on any plant, whether it be crops that we're talking about here or grass or flowers, it should have white roots um, that, that are, look very, very healthy and they don't look brown or black or, you know, that type of stuff. You can tell that they have uh, good growth patterns. Um, you can look at the pH level. The pH level is, and off on the right it tells you, um, it says it's best to test it at the same time every year. It's probably good to test it right before you plant it so you know if you need any nutrients and or to change it and then after you take the harvest out to see what was left after you did that and then you can make whatever adjustments for amendments to the soil. Basically a pH of 7 is neutral right around there a point either way of that is generally where most plants will grow. Um, there's certainly exceptions to every rule uh, and you'll learn that with each of the plants that you do on the type of farming that's happening but if you have a, a score of less than seven it means you have an acidic soil if it gets too acidic that means acid uh, it would not plants would not grow at all or very well even if they did if you get over a seven up to 14 is the highest it goes <coughs> um, that's called alkaline or base um, if it gets too high, it will not grow either. So either extreme, going down to zero or going up to 14 is not good. So somewhere between um, six and seven, and, or really six and a half, seven and a half is the best place to be. So checking the pH is an important thing. Soil erosion, you're going to know that because after a rainfall, you're going to have less soil that's there. But what you want to do is, how do you know you have a healthy condition? It doesn't run off when you have a heavy rain event or doesn't run off at all when it rains. Um, another thing to give you a good idea if you have good soil health there's earthworms in the soil so if you just dig up some soil somewhere and turn it over and break it apart if you um, see earthworms in there you know it's good. Earthworms aren't going to go into soil they don't like. Why are earthworms good? Because they create those holes as they are meandering through your soil and when they do that um, it is allowing a place for the water to be able to, to stay and it take, therefore it's going to be moisture soil and it's going to take longer to percolate through that soil and it will be a good thing for you. Um, the general rule of thumb is, is that if you have more than uh, 10 per cu cubic foot, you, the presence of worst worms um, is very good and that's what you want. Um, some more indicators uh, of, of the soil, and we covered this back in the chapter when we talked about the nutrients, and some of these words shouldn't be different, it's just restating it in a different way, maybe a more common way, not so technical, but the nutrient holding capacity, and basically what that means is how well is your soil able to hold those 17 nutrients that you have, the most important because they're the macronutrients are the nitrogen, nitrogen potassium, and phosphate, MPK, <coughs> um, and you want those to be steady or moving upward a little, but you don't want it too high either. And depending on what you're growing, the, the needs are going to be different, so you'll learn that as you go on also. Uh, it's best also to test at the same times every year, that couple times a year, as I was saying. Uh, another thing that will make a difference for your soil health is how compact is it. Um, right after planting or perhaps right after uh, harvesting because those are the times you're going to be in the fields doing the stuff. In other words, how much do you stomp that down? In what case it would be the tractors and the combines that would be doing that. Um, but a solid piece of wire or a rod should be able to puncture your soil to a depth of about 8 to 12 inches um, right after you plant or right after you harvest. If you can't, then you have too much soil compaction um, and you might have to deal with that. Water holding capacity. And this during the growing season, you're going to look at this, of course, because that's when you're concerned most with it. But can the soil hold the water below the surface for a week after a rainfall? So in other words, if you dig down about a foot and it's completely dry, okay, that means that it isn't, isn't able to hold water very long. Or if it's an example of what 2012 was across most of the U.S., um, it was so, there was such a drought because there wasn't rain, everything's going to be dry. You have no idea what the water holding capacity was there because you didn't have enough rain to know. 
Um, after a rain, um, the ability of the water to infiltrate the soil, you don't want it to just stand on top. You want it to be able to go down through the soil and eventually out of that area and hold some as it needs it for the watering needs of the plants that you have in the soil. Um, so you don't want it excessively wet and you certainly don't want that puddling. So if it's puddling, you have an issue that it can't infiltrate the soil. Um, the soil tilth, that's basically when you pick up soil that it's what it feels like is what tilth is. Uh, the soil should be moist a little bit, uh, not soggy wet. If it was right after rain, wouldn't be the time to test your soil tilth. You'd want the top to dry out a little bit. Um, but if it crumbles in your hand and it feels spongy and cushiony uh, to walk on when you're walking on it, it's got good soil tills. Um, current state of the ecology, you have to look at a bunch of different parameters related to that agroecosystem for sustainability. And basically, an ecologist would be a good person to get to come into an area to assess what the current state of it is. But you got to look at it over the long term. If you remember, sustainability is something that's supposed to last over the long term, not just the short term. Um, what are some of the economics for the ecology? Well, you have to look at what the production costs are for what you're doing. You have the seed, the equipment, the fertilizer, the pesticides. What profit level do you want to get? You have to look at the debt load uh, in, in terms of that. But you know, you have to look at when you're looking. Um, you, you get subsidies that could also help that. But if you weren't getting subsidies, would you be able to handle the debt load and would you get the profit level that you really want? Um, we have to look at how do we return to those ecologically based practices in order to get long term profitability. And then probably what's going to have to happen, there has to be changes to the economy that, are, that we have to look at that are going to affect whether we're going to get the profit and loss. What are we going to get for our crop? How much money? And that changes every year. Um, for instance, this year, at the point we're at right now, uh, corn prices are about down 30% over what they were at the beginning of when we were harvesting. So it's changed a whole lot. There's always a change, but 30% of a drop is a huge amount of it to change. So that's going to affect the profit levels for farmers this year. Um, in looking at some of the um, uh, ideas and how do we do this in a fair manner, well, if, if we're going to encourage farmers to become more ecologically minded and to have a better environment for us, we have to be able to say, hey, we're going to make sure that you get a fair return on that profit. No one should work for nothing. Um, the other thing is, how about trying to be more self-sufficient? If we're more self-sufficient, then we're not going to have to rely on some of those outside interferences, and that's going to be better for and have a better environment for everybody. Um, we're going to try to stay with a local harvest where we can. That, that's probably one of the hugest things because the whole food production system is going to have to ch eventually change as time goes on. Um, and then how do we get a stable community, a farming community, and create those social contacts? Well, things through co-ops and Farmers markets would certainly help in that process. Um, maybe going to um, local things like the county fairs and um, maybe have uh, classes through the uh, conservation districts to help talk about why this is important and what the farmers in the area uh, are doing. And I think the best way to do that is to show that you have the ability to take that successes that you've learned and get better at it as time goes on. Um, here's an example of a sustainable area. They just took an urban area and they put some things in there to help make it more sustainable uh, in terms of working with their wastewater. Um, so they have an area that used to be just a ditch and um, what they're doing is they're trying to have that rainwater instead of running off and getting down into their drinking water uh, that they have. They're trying to get ways in which this water will run slow and filter through stuff. And believe it or not, soil actually filters the uh, water before it gets back down. So they had a, a, a problem with um, water that coming off buildings and things like that that had the dirt and stuff in them that they found a way in order to slow it down and go through the soil and go back into that water table for their drinking water and make it uh, a much better and natural way of doing it instead of, not, instead of treating it with chemicals like a lot of it's done 
or has been done in the last 50, 60 years. Um, some indicators that we have um, that we're going to know we have some of those indicators, seeing that larger picture of our farm in relation to the entire system. Uh, a lot of times, um, many people weren't educated that, hey, what you do is affecting everyone around you too, so you have to look at that. You have to understand what that ecological foundation is, so you need to get those ecologists to help farmers understand where they're at, probably through those uh, county agents. Um, the social context should be factored into the equation. Everybody should be understanding this by doing the farmers markets and perhaps some education, perhaps some co-ops that this would help to develop long-term strategies where everybody wants to buy in. Um, and we're going to employ methods that will help us do that. Um, why is it important to change the ecology? Why does it matter for a person living in the city whether we change how we're growing things? And that can happen even within the city. And then how do we get <clears throat> the economic and ecological components to work together so it makes sense financially? That's probably a pretty big challenge, but it's one we can certainly keep working at to try to get there. And here's a list of the attributions that we have uh, for this unit. <clears throat> 